Back when I first started engineering electric vehicles, back in the long, long ago of 2009, people had concerns. One of the biggest concerns was that people would not be able to drive as far as they want without having to stop and plug in the car for 10 hours. This was exacerbated by the fact that there were several compliance turd cars that had painfully limited range. But range anxiety is a legitimate concern. Sure, you don't usually drive 400 miles in a single day, but sometimes you might. I already have anxiety. I don't need to add another kind of anxiety. What if I run out of electricity in the middle of nowhere and I'm left only with my thoughts, staring into the abyss of existence, achingly aware of the desolate meaninglessness of everything we do and everything we are? F that. We need fast chargers. This is one of the smartest things Tesla did early on. It took the biggest excuse people had about buying EVs and it made it go away. Now you can supercharge your Tesla at any one of over 25,000 superchargers. But can I supercharge this Tesla? Several people have asked if I will be able to supercharge the Jag, but it might not surprise you to know that the answer is a little more in-depth than a simple yes or no. For those of you that demand a simple answer up front, yes, probably a few times until I get sued. But I'm not going to, and the reason I'm not going to has to do with some technical and legal issues that I will go over right now. To make this car supercharge, I would need more Tesla parts than I currently have. Some of these parts I understand, like the thermal management system. Some I understand less, like the part of the car that talks to the supercharger and says, hey, let me get some of that DC sugar. We'll start with the part I do understand. Tesla has both active and passive cooling. Passive is when the coolant just runs through the radiator. This is how an internal combustion engine cools off. Works really well for internal combustion because they like running at about 200 degrees Fahrenheit and 200 is a lot hotter than it normally is outside. There's a big temperature difference, so the radiator works great. It's not technically called a radiator. The correct term is cooling rectangle. No, it's called a heat exchanger. It does radiate, but most of the heat transfer comes from forced convection. Next time someone calls it a radiator, you can correct them with that factoid and then you'll stop being invited to parties. Anyway, a radiator is passive cooling. Electric motors and batteries don't work at 200 degrees Fahrenheit. They like to be closer to 100. This complicates things because it is sometimes more than 100 degrees outside. In that case, you need active cooling. Active cooling is air conditioning. You use it to cool off the cabin, but Tesla also uses it to cool off the powertrain. They do this with a thing called a chiller, which is another heat exchanger that takes the coldness from the air conditioning system and transfers it to the powertrain coolant. Given my use case for this car, I probably don't need active cooling. I can probably get away with just a radiator. But if I want to supercharge this thing, I definitely need active cooling. You'll sometimes hear this at a supercharger station when there are several Teslas charging at full tilt. All their fans will be on trying to keep the battery cool. Adding this is possible. Tesla conveniently packages their entire cooling system in this cube up here with the battery, the small battery. There are people who have taken out this cube along with the vehicle front body controller and made it work with their Model 3 powertrains installed in other vehicles, so it is possible, but I'm probably not gonna do this. I might add air conditioning anyway, and if I do that, I'll probably add a chiller that will allow me to actively cool the powertrain, so if I decide to go to a racetrack or something, I'll be good, but I'll do it in a simpler way with just an AC compressor and a simple system. <music> Then there's the other part of this that I don't really understand, and that's the part where the car gives the supercharger the secret Tesla handshake, and then they begin their intimate 250 watt tango. This is where things start to get not so legal. Tesla does not allow a car to supercharge that has been wrecked and salvaged, nor do they allow supercharging on powertrain swaps. You plug your wrecked Tesla into a supercharger, and the supercharger says, nope. Digging around on some forums, I found out that some people have figured out a way to turn supercharging back on. According to what I've read, Tesla turns off supercharging by flipping a software switch inside your car. It's not done at the supercharger or in some communication between your car and the Tesla servers. Your car shows its credentials and the supercharger doesn't know or care if that's a fake ID. Some people have figured out how to flip this switch back on and then disable Tesla's ability to connect to the car to turn it off again. This is where things get murky. Here's the thing, it is technically legal for you to change the code in your car in such a way that would fool the supercharger into thinking your car is cool to charge. This is because Volkswagen cheated on emissions a few years ago and resulted in cars getting an exemption from the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. But 
as soon as you plug that car into a supercharger, you are illegally using Tesla's property. This would be like if you asked your neighbor Dan if you could run an extension cord over to his house to charge your Tesla, and Dan was like, How about no? And then you did it anyway. Dan's gonna call the cops on you. Now, if you do this with a salvaged Tesla, one that the company has switched off supercharging, nobody's gonna notice. Your Tesla will blend in with all the other Teslas. It would be like you sneaking over to Dan's house in the middle of the night, wearing all black, and then plugging in your Tesla for a few hours before Dan wakes up. Doing this in a 1950 Jaguar would be like stealing Dan's electricity in the middle of the day while wearing a clown wig and playing a trombone. Ill-advised, especially if you do it immediately after uploading a YouTube video describing specifically that you know it is illegal to steal Dan's electricity. As I said before, Tesla shuts off supercharging by sending a signal through the airwaves that changes the firmware inside your car. The interesting part about this is it might not technically be legal for Tesla to do this, Tesla cannot allow you to use their superchargers, but they can't reach into your car and change your car without your say-so. I'll leave that up to the lawyers. In any case, enough people have turned supercharging back on that Tesla has made a change to the way that they modify the firmware. It's apparently now done through the actual supercharger. Again, this is just based on what I've read online. I don't know about the specifics of this. Like I said, this is not my expertise. But there are people whose expertise this is, and I'm sure they are working fast to try to find another way around this. It's all a game of cat and mouse. If I did understand this part of the process, I probably wouldn't explain it here for two reasons. One, Tesla shuts off supercharging for salvaged vehicles for a pretty good reason. You remember before when I said you'd need active cooling because the battery gets hot during supercharging? Well, if you get into a wreck and your battery is slightly dented, just enough to deform one of the cells, that cell might be fine until it gets real hot at, say, a supercharger. That could cause the cell to go into thermal runaway. Tesla has done a remarkably good job of safety on the Model 3 battery in terms of preventing a full-blown battery fire, much more so than the Model S, which was actually still pretty safe. But once your car is severely wrecked, it might be okay to charge, but it might not be. It becomes an unknown variable. Also, whenever some dude on YouTube rips the battery guts out and crams them all willy-nilly into a 70-year-old Jaguar, that also becomes an unknown variable, and a possible battery fire. Imagine seeing a picture of a Tesla plugged into a supercharger and on fire going to be all over the news. In fact, it happened and it was all over the news. In Norway, a Model S caught fire at a supercharger station after there was a short in the high voltage junction box. Tesla might be hypersensitive to this sort of thing. There are tons of internal combustion car fires so common that it's not newsworthy, but one electric car catches fire and it's all over the blogs. And then some people will think that electric cars are more likely to catch fire. Tesla is not saying that I can't drive my salvaged car or even charge it. I can still use level two charging, which is what I'm gonna do. I just can't shove 250 watts of high voltage into it at their charging stations. And that makes sense. I like to think I know what I'm doing, but this is a very complicated system designed by tons of very smart people. I used to work for Tesla. The closest I got to supercharging was that I designed the steel structure that held up the original supercharger tower. Remember that thing? Looked like a giant penis. Anyway, they know where to find me and they know where to send the cease and desist letter. So while I could maybe dig through all the message board posts about firmware and EEP ROM switches and maybe change my code to make this car supercharge, I could not legally make this car supercharge. And as soon as I plug a 1950 Jaguar into a Tesla supercharger, someone is gonna take a picture of it. That picture is going on Instagram and that Instagram post will make its way to Tesla's legal department. And then I'm gonna be all like, but I didn't know. And they're gonna be all like, you uploaded a YouTube video that shows you clearly know. I may be able to get other types of DC fast charging to work so I could plug into an EV Go or whatever, but to do that, I will need active cooling. For now, I have level one and level two charging, which basically means that I can plug it in at my house, which is probably all I will ever do anyway. I'm not going on any road trips with this thing. And yes, it would be hilariously cool to roll up to a supercharger with this car in the same way that it was hilarious to park my Dodge Viper at a supercharger and shove the plug in my exhaust pipe. Or like when I stuck a supercharger plug in my Honda S600's non-functional gas cap. So yeah, I'll probably take the Jag to a supercharger for a photo op, but only for the laughs, not for the electrons. So to answer your question, can I supercharge this Jag? Probably, yes, I can technically supercharge this car. Once. But I'm not going to, because I want Tesla's legal team up my ass only slightly less than I want a car fire. It used to be that you had to impress people to get people to watch your show. Now you just have to impress the algorithm. So do me a favor, hit that subscribe button. All hail the algorithm. Mm -hmm.